During the Ordovician period, one of the five great mass extinctions occurred. And so you can see it here at the end of the Ordovician with the geologic time scale down at the bottom. So you have the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. So this is called the Carboniferous, and this is what most uh, countries in the world refer to this time period as. In the United States, we subdivide it into the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian period. We'll learn more about that in a little bit. Then you have the Permian. That it, so there's a mass extinction in the late Ordovician, one in the Devonian, which we don't really talk about too much. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the late Permian extinction. It's also referred to as the Great Dying. Um, it's a good time. There's something really cool that happens at the end of the Triassic that results in a big mass extinction. Then we have the Jurassic and Cretaceous period. And we can see that there is a big crash in biodiversity at the end of the Cretaceous period. And this is where most non-avian dinosaurs go extinct. And then you can see the emergence of the age of mammals. So I know you guys have been talking a lot about what mass extinctions are and what might cause them. Mass extinctions in, in the end of the Ordovician, 85% of all known species go extinct. Um, I have some pictures here that show you what some of those organisms look like, although you should remember some. So a nautilus is a variety of coiled shelled cephalopod and the most common ones, um, well, we'll talk about that when we get more into the, um, into the Mesozoic. So these were groups of nautiloids that went extinct in the Ordovician period, groups of echinoderms, including uh, crinoids like this. So remember that a lot of times with crinoids, we can see that they have like this, it looks like a stack of dimes here, the stem that connects to the calyx. And then these are all the fun little fronds that come off of um, a crinoid. This one is epizoic. Did you know that? Because it is attached to a coral. So it lives on top of something that's alive. Very cool. Speaking of coral, anthozoa is the sciencey name for coral. Many groups of coral went extinct in the Ordovician period, along with many groups of bryozoans. So remember that bryozoans are even more um, sort of delicate and small in size of their little dots, I guess you could say. Um, they're often called sea fans. You can see why. Uh, and conodonts go extinct. Those uh, phosphatic little teeth that are microscopic in size, those organisms go extinct in the Ordovician, and so do many groups of trilobites. Not all of them. The remaining trilobites go extinct during the Great Dying, which you'll learn about next unit. So this is kind of a cool graph. This shows you sea surface temperature here in red, um, and here's the Ordovician Silurian boundary. So you can see that at just prior to the Ordovician boundary, you have this incredible drop in temperature that then goes up a bit when the Silurian starts. And then that's mapped against this green curve here, which is biodiversity. So you can see the biodiversity climbs and climbs and climbs until just around the end of the Ordovician and then crashes sort of around the same time that sea surface temperature also crashes. This gray shaded area shows you where modern equatorial sea surface temperature is. That's what that stands for. So you can see that at the end of the Ordovician, equatorial sea surface temperatures dropped. So why? Um, and how did that impact the organisms that were living at the time? There's evidence in the end Ordovician for an ice age, not the first ice age, but an ice age. One that was significant enough that sea level ended up dropping between two and 300 feet, which is comparable to what we experienced in the last ice age in North America about 12,000 years ago. So here is a paleogeographic map. These are so fun. I like them so much. You can see here is North America and these are the Appalachian Mountains and they're pretty much in the equatorial region. This is Europe and this is uh, Siberia right here. And you can see all the shallow water organisms that would be living in this light blue area, which is shallow water. Um, and so all of those organisms, when sea level drops significantly, that puts tremendous loss, uh, a tr tremendous stress on their habitats. So they're most severely impacted by this extinction. It turns out that the fossil record is incredibly biased towards shallow water organisms anyway, because it, they're just simply the easiest rocks for us to get when sea level drops. Um, we can find those fossils and when sea level rises, they, that's when they live on the continents and that's when we can find them in the future. So sea level, which is abbreviated here SL, does begin to arise, rise again about a million years later, which is when the Silurian period starts and the extinction event is over. So the Silurian period is also significant because it sees um, 
another or significant orogeny. Uh, this one is called the Acadian Caledonian orogeny. And you can kind of see Hudson Bay here in New York in this general area. In fact, right here, there's the, the Great Lakes, which is which did not exist at the time, but are just there for your own location purposes. You can see that the Appalachian Mountains here are sometimes referred, well, now they're called the Appalachians, but at the time, they, geologists refer to them as the Acadian Mountains. And then if we continue over into Greenland and parts of Western Europe, you can see these are called the Caledonian Mountains and through here. And during this time period, a large microcontinent called Avalonia was accreted onto uh, Laurentia, which is North America, and Baltica, which is a craton that is part of modern day Europe. Um, so Avalonia is a microcontinent or an allochthonous terrain, and um, it's sutured together with Laurentia and Baltica. And I'm just gonna show you, it's only a few minutes long, this smart figure about the creation of the Appalachians um, because we, they're th created pretty much by a series of mountain ranges. Bentley, welcome back for oh. another smart figure. After watching this video, you should be able to describe the sequence of tectonic events that took place to produce the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern United States. The Appalachians are a very scenic place. It doesn't look like a mountain range like the Alps or the Himalayas. It's much more subdued than that. What ended up happening to produce the Appalachians were a series of tectonic collisions that took place during the Paleozoic era of geologic time. The Appalachians were actually built in three pulses of mountain building. Then they were eroded to grind them down to the present state of topography. Around 600 million years ago, off the shore of North America, there was an ocean basin, which some would call the Ancestral Atlantic or the Iapetus Ocean. And in that Ancestral Atlantic Ocean, there were various land masses, including a volcanic island arc and a microcontinent. On the far side of the ocean basin was the continent of Africa. Now a subduction zone first brought the volcanic island arc into contact with the edge of North America. That collision took place around 450 million years ago and it's called the Taconic Orogeny. The next collision to take place was with the microcontinent, which is sometimes called Avalonia. Avalonia collided with the edge of North America around 350 million years ago in the second phase of Appalachian mountain building, the Acadian orogeny. But there was still some ocean basin left and Africa on the far side. As that ocean basin closed due to subduction, we ended up seeing the final phase of Appalachian mountain building, the Alleghenian orogeny. This took place starting around 300 million years ago and it was pretty much wrapped up by around 250 million years ago. The moment that ancestral Atlantic Ocean was finally consumed was the moment that Pangaea was born. Notice now that there's continuous land all the way across this cross-section. Of course, something happened since then, and that's that Pangaea broke apart and the new Atlantic Ocean opened up. So Africa pulled away again, although Africa left behind a little scrap of its continental crust. That, for instance, underlies Florida. And then you can see these other exotic terrains of the microcontinent and also the ancestral Atlantic ocean sediments and the volcanic island arc. Those have been smashed onto the edge of North America or accreted. And you can see that there was also a bunch of deformation that included a piece of the North American continental crust being shoved up and on top of its neighbors and then the wrinkling of all the sedimentary layers that were west of that. So these are the different provinces of the Appalachian mountain belt that we see today. The Appalachian Plateau, the Valley and Ridge Province, the Blue Ridge Province, and the Piedmont. The coastal plain is the newest geologic province on eastern North America. It's basically a blanket of sediments that have been laid down since the Atlantic Ocean opened up. Let's zoom into Pennsylvania here. This is a classic view of the Susquehanna River cutting through the Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania. You can actually see several of these provinces right here in this picture. See if you can pick them out. All right, well, hopefully you identified the sinuous valleys and ridges that are so prominent in the central part of this picture as the Valley and Ridge Province, which in Pennsylvania they call the Ridge and Valley Province. To the west of that, basically everything over here in this region, that's the Appalachian Plateaus. Then you've got a little bit of the Blue Ridge province, and then the Piedmont is to the southeast of that. Thanks very much for your attention. This has been another smart figure. Just so you know, 
as many times as I've watched that video, I've never been able to pick out all four of those provinces, but apparently Callan can. So, Callan's a good dude. Um, so the Acadian Caledonian orogeny involved the accretion of the microcontinent Avalonia onto Laurentia. And just like when the Taconic orogeny formed, the erosion of that created the Queenston Clastic Wedge, the erosion of the Acadian Caledonian orogeny created the Catskill Clastic Wedge in our region. This was followed by a time period called the Tippy Canoe Transgression. Um, remember, transgressions are large rises in sea level, and Tippy Canoe is just an awesome word, and you should say it out loud. Uh, BT dubs, this link doesn't work anymore. Don't bother. Um, the Tippy Canoe Transgression, I mentioned because it's locally important. Um, several rock layers in western New York were deposited during the Tippy Canoe Transgression. When you either complete your, when we learn about the Rochester Gorge, the geology of the Rochester Gorge, your second to last lab, um, you're going to actually see the Grimsby and the Thorold and the Rinales, um limestone. So the, these are rock layers that are locally important. The Grimsby sandstone is actually used in tons of um, buildings in Rochester, New York. And uh, these rock layers are overlain by a couple of rock layers, but importantly, the Lockport Dolomite. The Lockport Dolomite or the Lockport Dolostone is locally very important. Niagara Falls actually flows over it. It's a very resistant rock layer. I'll show you more in just a second. But if you ever drive along I-90 in uh, Western New York, uh, near like the Depew exit on your way to Buffalo, and you look out the side of your window, you'll see a giant hole in the ground, and that is a quarry. It's a Dolostone quarry. It is one of seven Dolostone quarries in western New York. It's used, that Dola stone that is used is um, mostly for construction materials. It's pretty resistant to weathering, um, which is why Niagara, the Niagara River, as it flows over the Lockport Dola stone, doesn't really dissolve it away very quickly. It creates the capstone of Niagara Falls. Um, also, if you live in the Rochester area, you can see the Lockport Dola stone exposed when you're driving near, on 490, where you have the 490-531 split. Or um, really anytime they're doing construction around 490 and you see rocks that look like little bricks, that's the Lockport Dola Stone. Um, they're exposed near like the Blossom Road exit. All right, I promise I'm not going to tell you every location that the Dola Stone is present, but it's in a lot of places. So good stuff. It That Dola Stone forms the Niagara Escarpment. So here is Niagara Falls and that is the rock layer again that Niagara Falls is flowing over, but the Niagara Escarpment runs east-west um, from Niagara Falls all the way across um, the uh, west central portion of New York. Uh, Ridge Road in Rochester is right along uh, parts of the Niagara Escarpment. Very cool. Um, another thing that is locally important is a rock layer called the Salina Group. Uh, Salina sounds like saline, and it should. The Salina Group is a series of rock salt layers that were deposited during the Tippy Canoe transgression. So here is good old Rochester, and you can see that it's in this area that is sort of shaded, this light brown. These are um, enclosed basins, and were enclosed basins during the Silurian period, and there were high evaporation rates. The other thing that's kind of cool is we were really close to the equator at this point. So there are a series of reefs that are found. Um, reefs are very close to sea level, like within just a few feet of sea level most of the time. So what they did was these reefs formed sort of a ring-like structure. And within the ring-like structure, um, seawater couldn't really get into it. So seawater couldn't really get over the reefs. So you had high evaporation rates because I'll show you why in just a second. You have high evaporation rates with salt water. So the water gets taken away, but the salt remains. And then the salt gets deposited in these very thick rock layers called the Salina Group, um, over 2,500 feet thick in some locations near Michigan, the central basin of Michigan. But you can see in New York, we're not too shabby either, over a thousand feet thickness in some locations. So how do these rock layers form? Well, basically you have a basin, an enclosed basin that is restricted from ocean circulation. And in this case, there were extensive reef deposits. So you have sea water that flows in around all these reefs, right? 
And then if you go down here, the seawater goes in, you have high evaporation rates, the water is removed and the salt remains and it forms the dense brines means really, really salty water. And then you start to get precipitated salt layers in the bottom. So salt layers don't just occur randomly. Um, they're typically associated with about 30 degrees north and south latitude. So these are the location of desert environments around the globe. And um, this is the Tropic of Cancer in the north here and the Tropic of Capricorn in the south, which are about 23 and a half degrees. So a little bit further north or south of that is where you see about 30 degrees latitude and that's where your deserts occur. It's pretty cool. So why are there deserts at 30 degrees north and south latitude? Well, it's because of oceans. It's because of air circulation. So at the equatorial regions, air is warm. And what we know about convection, especially in the mantle, is that warm air rises. And then as it cools off, it begins to sink. Well, where the sinking occurs is typically right at about 30 degrees north latitude. So the air that's falling here is really dry. So why, and that air that's at the surface gets brought closer to the equator where it rises up. It's dry because as that air mass travels from north in this case, it's precipitating the whole way. Precipitate, precipitate, precipitate. Oh, I'm almost out of precipitation and now it falls. So the falling air around 30 degrees north latitude is really dry. Same thing in the southern hemisphere. So you have that warm tropical air that rises and then go and then flows away from this sort of upwelling here and it's raining, 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 raining. Oh, we're out of precipitation and that's where it falls again. Um, so 30 degrees north and south latitude, definitely prone to uh, desert environments. Or in this case, when you have desert environments, you also have like high evaporation rates. So um, you have salt layers that were deposited. So let's move along. We're going to start to talk about a little about the late Paleozoic. And this will be our last period that we talk about uh, before we do a little activity. So a significant event that occurred during the Devonian period is called the Kaskaskia transgression. So let's take a minute to look at this Devonian paleogeography map. So first we see that we've only oriented it like this because this is how we're sort of used to seeing um, North America, but you can see here was the equator. Um, so you can kind of rotate, tilt your head a little bit. So you're looking at it as uh, you would have in the Devonian. So if you look, you can see the Acadian Highlands here. This is These are the eroding um, Acadian Caledonian Mountains. And here's the Catskill Red Bed. So this is, these are basically rivers, right, that are shedding sediment from the Acadian Highlands down into the Catskill uh, Clastic Wedge. And then you get underwater. And you can see that the majority of North America is really underwater now. And that's what this gr light green area is. And it extends all the way down through the Hudson Valley. Um, and you have shales and sandstones in through here. The only other part of North America that is above sea level at this point is you have this transcontinental arch kind of through the Midwest, as well as the very baby portions of the um, Rocky Mountains that we're gonna talk about in just a couple minutes. So um, most of North America, covered in shale and sand and that is awesome because sand super porous super permeable shale super porous not permeable at all and so this creates areas where we can really uh, find a lot of energy bearing units mostly we're talking about oil in this in this time period so here is a map of all the major oil plays in North America. And I'm going to first take a second and show you how oil and gas forms. What drives our cars, buses, and planes? Powers our electricity and allows us to cook our food and heat our water. Most of today's energy needs are met by fossil fuels, like coal, oil, and gas. These unique, high-energy fuels are non-renewable resources that took millions of years to form. About two billion years ago, marine organisms like algae and microscopic animals and plants 
died and settled on the ocean floor. Beneath other sediments in the ocean, and in the absence of oxygen, these fossils changed into a substance called kerogen. Under heat and pressure, kerogen gradually changes into oil or gas. The whole process usually takes at least a million years. At the molecular level, oil and gas are hydrocarbons made up of hydrogen and carbon atoms. The constant pressure and movement of the Earth's crust squeezes oil and gas through the pores or spaces within rocks. Some oil and gas reaches the Earth's surface and seeps out naturally into land or water. Often it is trapped beneath the surface by impermeable layers or rock structures, like faults and folds. Within the crust, oil or gas deposits build up and form reservoirs. Reservoirs are like vast sponges filled with oil and gas. They can be as large as a city. To find oil and gas deposits, geologists use a number of different survey techniques, including seismic surveys, gravitational surveys, and geological mapping. Seismic surveys use reflected sound waves to produce a 3D view of the Earth's interior. New technologies, such as four-dimensional projections and sophisticated graphic renderings of rock structures, are improving the way we find conventional oil and gas deposits. Energy resources that are currently difficult or expensive to extract are called unconventional oil and gas. In a world with limited energy resources, people are looking at more efficient ways of tapping into unconventional oil and gas or at alternative and renewable sources of energy from biofuels or the sun. What do you think will be the energy sources of the future? Of the future. Awesome. So um, all of the rock layers. So again, these are all the major oil and gas plays in North America. And the ones I'm going to circle are the ones that were deposited during the Kaskaskia transgression. Like this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. This, oh, and that's it. Um, <laughs> So about a third or so of all major oil and gas units were deposited during the Kaskaskia transgression. Um, so on the last slide, I teased about the antler orogeny. The antler orogeny is the result of subduction on the West Coast. And these are, as so you can see in Nevada, is the location where these are just the most ancestral that you can get for the Rocky Mountains. So a portion of the much larger Rocky Mountains today that extend all the way over, well, through Colorado. What happened, and we've only been talking about the East Coast this whole semester, was that the West Coast switched from what geologists called a passive margin to an active margin. And the words really say it all. An active margin is a plate is a place where plates are converging. Um, that can be ocean to ocean convergence. It can be ocean to continent or continent to continent convergence, but any location where there is a site of convergence. So today that is portions of the West Coast, like specifically up in through uh, Oregon and Washington state. That is an example of an active margin. There's usually a lot of volcanic activity there. There's a lot of earthquakes, things like that. Whereas the East Coast of the North of North America today is a passive margin. Passive means right not very confrontational. And in this case, North America is actually fused to the oceanic plate that's coming off of the Mid Atlantic Ridge, and we are just kind of drifting to the west in like the same direction, the same speed, kind of like uh, railway cars, right? We're moving in the same direction at the same speed, so there's no um, sort of interaction, no convergence. So this is, I wanted to give you these terms, but I also wanted to introduce you to the idea that this is the very first time in North American history that we have any evidence for active margin activity in the Western US. All right, we're gonna do something different and then come back and talk about the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian periods that the rest of the world just calls the Carboniferous.